Good morning and welcome to the February 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Board of Oil, Gas and Mining. Uh, as is our custom, we'll be starting with a briefing session given by the division. So I would like to turn the time over to Director Baza. Thank you, Chair Borden. Uh, again, my name is John Baza. I'm the director of the Division of Oil, Gas and Mining. Uh, just for your information, I think the virtual link for the board members was just sent out again. So hopefully we'll have uh, member Garrison and member Sierra join us shortly online. So the briefing items this morning, um, we have traditionally liked to come before the board and provide each program in the division an opportunity to give you um, an annual program update. So this time around, it is the oil and gas program's turn. And to do that, I have Deputy Director Bart Kettle here, who is going to provide you with that uh, program update. Thanks, Bart. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Director Baza. Um, as uh, Director Baza said, I'm Bart Kettle, Deputy Director uh, for the Oil and Gas Program. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, a couple items. First of all, the people that we have in the Oil and Gas Program, the work they do, uh, some of the changes in industry activity we're observing, and then some of the challenges we're facing. So starting out, um, I believe it was at the December board hearing, we introduced new staff. And I just kind of have a picture there to the right of people that are either new to our program this last year or are in new positions the last year. And uh, Excuse me. Oh, there it is. Okay. Just came up. Thank couldn't you. see it. Now I can see it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, in... And so just in kind of introducing these people, I really want to give kind of a shout out to the oil and gas program staff. I mean, if you look at what the program is, it is the people. And I, I want to kind of give them a shout out for their expertise and their knowledge and kind of the things that they do to help us accomplish our jobs. And each of these six individuals you see in the picture, they're all playing a critical role for us in the work they're doing and the new things they're doing. But they're also supported by kind of the staff that are here existing previously that are really taking time out of their schedule to help them get on pace and make them successful. So I want to give a shout out to all of them. Uh, the program, we are the primary inspection group for some 6,000 wells that are on state or fee lands. Um, as you know, we issue oil and gas permits, so that's applications for permit to drill. That's also processing sundry notices. Uh, we maintain records for every well uh, drilled in the state. And then one of the things that's got some recent attention is the management of shut-in or orphan wells. So just to kind of start out um, as far as activity, uh, this year in the le general legislative session, there's a request for funding allocation aimed at um, the processing of APDs in the oil and gas program. And so I wanted to give you just a little context of like where things are and what's happening. The graph you see in 2022. And just to give you a little bit of a barometer of what all of that might mean, we averaged somewhere around 30 APDs a month in the previous five years leading up to this year. So, you know, you can see from that graph, really the second half of the year, we were well over that the entire second half and even slightly over that in the first half of the year. Um, and then uh, the, the next slide just talks about the approval processing time for APDs over the last three years. And this is one of the things that, um, once again, I kind of want to give the people a shout out who do this work and who are responsible for it. Um, we've got the number of days it takes to process an APD down three consecutive years. Um, currently, this year, uh, that group has processed 172 APDs as of today. Just to give you a little reference, they did 340 last year. So they're nearly four, nearly half of what they did um, all of last year already at this point in the year. Um, I like to show this graphic just to kind of help people understand what's going on activity-wise in the state. So if we look at the pie chart on the left-hand side of the screen, it just shows the existing wells by breakdown of what their lease type is. Um, and 
since Utah is primarily a federal state, you would expect we'd have a lot of federal wells, and we do. Um, the one that I probably would like to draw your attention to would be the little red sliver at the top. Um, it, you, when I put this chart together previously, it used to look like a printing error. Now it's starting to actually look like maybe a, a little bit of a wedge or a sliver, but it's still a very small percentage of the wells in the state. It also represents a majority of the wells that are being drilled in the state, and of course a lot of the production for both oil and natural gas that's occurring in the state. Um, so then just if I can draw your attention to the right side and, and the new permits, that's permits that we received last year. Um, and we're, we're getting federal permits again. So if we could rewind back to 2021, this graph looked like um, pretty much equal parts between federal, tribal, private, and multiple. And we've seen a little bit of a switch this year. So a lot of the federal permits we're seeing are in Uinta County. A lot of them are, are for natural gas. We haven't seen those permits in a while. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is how many multiple mineral types we're, we're seeing for wells. Um, and that being nearly a third of the permits we see now, most of those being a mixture of both tribal and fee minerals, but occasionally some federal or state mixed in there as well. Um, so as far as drilling activity, we had the highest number of wells spudded or just the first boring of the well started last year since 2014. Um, Generally speaking, you could consider 2014 kind of when horizontal wells started to be drilled in the state. So last year represents the most wells we've seen spudded over that period of time. And, you know, the last couple of years it's trending up quite a bit. Obviously in 2020, the COVID year, a uh, pretty low number of wells spudded in that year. Uh, one of the questions that we regularly get asked is about production. And if you think back to the, the number of wells started, really this graph shows the same thing. We had a pretty significant drop in production for oil in 2020 and in 2022. It's one of our higher years in the state for oil production. Then the, the more interesting one would be natural gas production in the state. So we've been seeing somewhere between an eight and 12% decline in natural gas production year over year for a long time. Um, 2021 was the first year when that, when that kind of flattened out and our production stayed level. 2022, obviously it's increased. Um, most of that production so far is coming from the Central Basin area. Um, but it'll be interesting to see this year if we see some in Southern Uinta County or in other natural gas producing areas of the state. Uh, it, for those of you that maybe attended or watched the collaborative meetings this last year, one of the collaborative subjects was talking about kind of the midstream constraints and how difficult it is to get gas out of that area where those pipelines exceed 90% capacity almost every day. And so that'll be kind of an interesting thing to watch and see what it means for our gas production in the state. Yeah, go ahead, Gordon. So you look at this graph, uh, natural gas production has been going down mm -hmm. and it's just barely having an uptick now, but we have this constraint problem. Is that just because that's of where the natural gas is being produced, more in the Central Basin, Duchesne County versus the Uinta Basin? Because looking at this, you wouldn't think you'd have a constraint because we've dropped way down and we're just barely a little uptick. Yeah, so, so what we see if we kind of look at like the counties for production over time, Duchesne County is the only county that's increasing in its natural gas production. And in the Central Basin production, a little bit of it occurs on that far western part of Uinta County, but almost all of it occurs, you know, essentially between Roosevelt and Duchesne and Duchesne County. And so I, I think this graph just kind of represents that that production has increased to the point that the transportation will allow it at this point. Um, and you probably won't see significant changes unless there's ability to transport more gas. Now, you know, we are seeing APDs again in Uinta County. Um, where there may be some exploration for gas in the future, and that could also influence it. And Bart, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it seems that we've had some gas plant closures in the last 10 years as well, and so the ability to process that gas may be somewhat limited. Yeah, I mean, if, if you uh, well, generally speaking in the industry, and I almost hate to talk about this with all of you on the board because you probably are more knowledgeable than I am, but 
2008 was when gas prices really fell. There was a lot of infrastructure put in at that, you know, in that era to kind of accommodate what the thought was for future production. But then with this essentially decade long sustained, you know, suppressed gas prices, eventually industry moves on and uses infrastructure other places. And so as Director Baza said, yeah, there's a few, few things that it, it, it's not that production can't be ramped back up, but that it's, you know, decisions have been made a different way over that decade. A quick question, just to confirm, the axis of that graph is in in cubic feet. Is that? Um, it's it's in million MCF. Million MCF. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so the next thing I want to talk about is orphan and idle wells, and that's a subject over the last couple of years. It's been kind of popular. Uh, because of the infrastructure bill, there's been a lot of talk about this. And I, and I recognize the graphic on the right is the wording on it's quite small and you really can't read it. But really the takeaway on it is just the arrow shows where Utah is. Um, and Utah sits with a really low orphan well count. And if I could kind of leave you with a message today, it would be that that's really a product of some three decades of active management. Um, the program started in 92. There's been a lot of good decisions made along the way to get to that point of a very low orphan well count. Um, and and I, I didn't have the ability to display this, but this data is from um, the Interstate Oil and Gas Conservation Commission compiled in 2021. And if you were to compare the data from 2019, you would see a, a significant increase in orphan wells in some areas. But in Utah, there really wasn't. And I think that's just a reflection of the fact that there was this active management going on for some three decades. And we did kind of know what was out there. Um, and so just talking about that, um, part of the reason we have a low inventory of orphan wells is because what the program does with idle wells and how it interacts with industry to manage those wells. And so I want to give kudos to both the program and industry for really doing a pretty decent job in Utah, taking and managing idle wells and not letting them accumulate and becoming orphan wells in the future. Um, the program has a procedure where we look at those wells monthly, work with the operators monthly, and then if wells do become orphan, we've got a pretty active plugging program where we're out plugging wells each year to not let them accumulate. Um, the wells are plugged primarily on operator bond for flitchers, and that's one of the things kind of the active administration does is a lot of times we have dollars above the minimum bonding to go deal with these wells. Um, and, and that kind of reduces the financial impact on other things. Uh, the conservation fund, pay, uh, basically a tax on production paid by industry is also used to kind of make up the difference that bonds don't make, don't cover. And then one potential funding in the future would be infrastructure dollars. Um, we, haven't, we haven't had to pursue those yet, basically because we have a really low inventory. But if I can get you to think back to production and think back to 2020, you know, that was a really tough time on the industry. Um, the impacts of that are still working its way through the system. You know, there's a few operators out there that may not be solvent as, as that's kind of working its way through. And so there's a chance that here in the future we'll see a few more orphan wells uh, come about because of that. And, and the way I would liken it is for those of us that play card games, you know, sometimes you get dealt a really crappy hand. It's super hard to win with a crappy hand. You do the best you can, and, and you play it the best you can, but it's a little tough. And that's kind of what COVID was on the industry. It was a rough hand that was dealt to them. And so we'll see how that works out going forward. Um, Sorry, two, two questions on that graph. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Utah numbers look vanishingly small, but do you, could you tell us how many wells are depicted on the graph here? Or? Um, there's 27 state and fee orphan wells in the state. And, and, and so if we include federal and state and fee wells in the state, it's generally under 50 wells year in, year out. That's great. Um, and I can't read the two first states on the, the left side of the, the graph. Huh? Pennsylvania. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the two highest states are Pennsylvania and Kentucky, um, followed by New York and Texas, you know, and, and there's a couple things that 
I, I, there's an active program in the state of Utah that's helped us get where we are. Um, we also kind of have to acknowledge that that's where some of the first wells were drilled in the U.S. And so by default, they didn't have a regulatory framework in place and ended up with a few more orphan wells because of that. But a few. <laughs> Thanks. You bet. Okay, so I want to talk about um, some of the program highlights for the, from the last year. So kind of tying in with what I talked about um, with the people before. Uh, this past year, the, the oil and gas program completed the highest number of inspections ever at over 11,000 inspections. Um, that's more than 1,000 more that was ever completed in a previous year. And, and once again, there's kind of a little backstory there. Um, we brought in what I feel like is a really high quality group of inspectors three years ago. Two years ago, we were able to add some automation to the workflow in electronic forms, and last year they completed the highest number of inspections ever completed. So it's, it's really a product of really, really high quality people, some innovations that help them get there, and then them going and doing the work. And that kind of ties into one of the, the next highlight, creating efficiencies. I think that's one of the things the program's done very well that we're quite proud of is we've figured out how to use some of the automation, you know, some of our organized database to help us do our job more efficiently and keep pace with some of the demands we have. Um, I know I've already hit on this, but I think it's really important. The quality of people we're getting is just top notch. The average person comes to us with 15 years of industry type experience before they start with the division. So they're already very knowledgeable. They have to learn our regulatory process, but they're very good when they start. And then another thing that we're fairly proud of is our stakeholder relations, rather that be the industry we regulate, rather that be you as the board, rather that be the general public. That's something that we've worked hard to kind of maintain and we're fairly proud of. Um, challenges, I want to give a little personal story on this to kind of introduce that. Yes, that's me. No, it was not my favorite day ever. Um, but it, I had a plan on how to deal with this day. I was, I was asked to go check some wells, um, and I knew it was going to be muddy, and so I got a really early start that day and, and checked the well that I needed to do. And while I was there, I wanted to be efficient with my time, so I grabbed a couple more, and it was a pretty good plan to get them done and get out of there before it thawed except there was a sunny corner on the road that angled towards these rocks that fell in, and, and lo and behold, when I tried to drive past there, the truck slid towards them. And I ended up laying in the mud, chaining up the truck to get out of there before I munched it up on the rocks. And, and I, the analogy I wanna put here is, I had a plan, it didn't work perfectly, I had to get a little dirty to get through the rest of the way of it, and I view our challenges the same way. Um, We've got a plan in place on how we're gonna deal with stuff and make it a little dirty in the process. So a couple things that we're seeing. Um, it's been all over the news story, turnovers hurting various um, groups right now. We're not immune to it. We've got lower turnover than the society as a whole, but we've seen a little bit of turnover in our oil and gas program as well recently. And where it's kind of hurt us is the loss of institutional knowledge. Just to give you a reference, um, five years ago, the program averaged over 15 years of experience here in the program. Currently, we're at eight, so we're basically half in an eight-year period of time, which is a, is a big loss. Um, and, and then the second place that's kind of a double whammy is employee recruitment's got a little tough. Um, we are seeing about 80% of the applications right now that we previously seen. We're not unique. A lot of Utah's seeing this, a lot of society's seeing this. Um, Utah is the, the second fastest growing state, um, and with that comes a higher cost of living, and there's also a lot of opportunity. So we're kind of, you know, the news headlines are full of employee, um, basically shortages in the workforce. And we're not unique in that, but it hits home with us a little bit too. Um, and then we're also competing against the oil and gas industry that, that has a very high wage standard. Um, with that being said, once again, I want to reiterate how high a quality I think the people we've got the last couple of years are. They're really, really good. We feel super fortunate to have gotten them. And so the third item that I want to talk about for just a moment was in last year's general session, we were given direction to go seek primacy from the Environmental Protection Agency for geologic carbon sequestration. And we're starting to walk down that road. We've got uh, a manager in place to do that. He's starting to build a staff and, and getting ready to submit the application. But I just wanna bring it up as it's a challenge. This is gonna be a multi-year process for us to kind of walk through that process of both rulemaking and then also 
uh, submitting the application to the EPA for primacy. And so that is it for my slides, as I kind of like summarize up, if, if I could have you remember anything from what I said today, it would just be how good our people are and, and really how proud I think they should be of the work they're doing. And then that, yeah, we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in industry. I know you as a board members are starting to see more docketed items, and that also reflects that um, and, and their challenges, but we've got a plan, even if we have to get a little dirty to implement that plan. So that's it, thank you. Any questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Hansen. <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on the question that uh, Mr. Moon asked on the decline and then the increase in uh, natural gas drilling and production. Do you know what the plans are to reduce the restriction in, in the delivery system? I know that Director Baza said, you know, they don't have a lot of the infrastructure that they had before. Do you know, are, they, are there their plans to increase that so that, you know, maybe we can get back up to where we were in 2012? Um, I'll speak on it at a high level. Um, so the first part is, is, is when we look at kind of like the regulatory framework of how we sit in there, we deal with the upstream, so the exploration and the production end. The part you're asking about is the transportation, sure. so the midstream. So, so there's a limit to how much we can speak on it. But um, there is a proposal to get additional transportation capacity out of that central basin area. Um, it's in the NEPA process right now to kind of get across the federal lands. It's got to go to connect to the south. Um, I can't tell you exactly what stage of that's in. I know it, it was, it was um, waiting for basically the archeological approval on it um, probably about 30 days ago. I don't know for sure if that's been approved, but that's one of the things that's in the works. I, I, I've been informed that there's a few upgrades at some of the compressor sites and that associated with the existing infrastructure to increase capacity a little bit too. I don't know time frames on them though. Okay, I, I was just noticing that that downward curve kind of corresponds while I've been on the board and then of course, Gordon, you too. We're not gonna claim responsibility for that. One of the things that we could do, um, we could uh, take and share a YouTube link of our collaborative meeting where I felt like the presenter did a pretty good job detailing this out that might be a little bit informative for you to watch that, kind of that 10 minutes of the collaborative. That would be great, thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? Yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Kettle, on the uh, horizontal drilling that's going on now, is the GOR such that you foresee any problem with flaring or do we have uh, enough infrastructure to take away the gas where the uh, oil wells are being drilled now. No, that's a real concern is, is the takeaway for gas in those areas is definitely a real concern. Uh, that I was actually gonna ask a similar question. So uh, the difference between 2012 and today, um, is some of that increased flaring? <laughs> Is that where the natural gas is going, or is it just less production? <laughs> no, it's less production. Um, the production you see in 2012 would really account for kind of a decade of, of exploration um, in the coal bed methane stuff in Carbon and Emory County, as well as um, the gas fields in Southern Uinta County. That's really what represents that height of it. And then the subsequent decline over time is just a representation of, you know, the wells are aging and they're not putting new wells in just because it's not, they're not economically incentivized to do so. And so the production is just continued to decline until we're kind of seeing maybe some of the associated gas with these oil wells um, starting to pick up the slack in the last couple of years. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Chairman Borden. Um, maybe to give some comfort to Mr. Hansen and Mr. Moon, even though gas production declined in that period of time, I think we've seen oil production actually start to ramp up. And as Bart said, one of the uh, contributors to additional gas right now is the associated gas coming off of the new wells being drilled, uh, the horizontal drilling that's occurring. So 
that's adding to the production volumes that we're seeing right now. And I <clears throat> honestly, what Bart mentioned about uh, the decline in coal bed methane makes a lot of sense to that graph. I didn't, I didn't really think about that going offline, but that's had a significant decline through that time period. Absolutely. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll move on to our next item. Thank you so much, Bart. It's a great presentation. Did he, did he raise his hand? The next item uh, is... Uh, one, one moment, sorry, Director Baza. Uh, Mr. Walker, did you have a question? I will take that as a no. Oh, you may be muted. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Bart was saying there that, you know, your primary infrastructure uh, company as far as uh, transmission of natural gas down in that area, area was Questar Pipeline. And they, and there's been a little turmoil in that um, industry for a while because Questar got sold to Dominion. Dominion then sold the, the pipeline assets and the uh, and the storage facilities to another company, and then that company just the other day sold the, the pipeline and the storage facilities to another company. So they have changed hands about four times here in the last three years, I think. Um, and so that you know that could dampen, if you would, expansion of the uh, transmission system. For, for a little bit. Now Williams out of Tulsa Tech, out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, now owns those uh, transmission systems and storage facilities. And so we may see if uh, Williams steps up. Back to you, Mr. Baza. All right, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next item on the briefing agenda. And thanks again to Mr. Kettle. Um, this is going to be a legislative update. I'm not gonna... During the legislative session, we try to do this to provide you with not only weekly updates, but uh, updates at the board meeting on what's going on up on the Hill. And to do that, uh, Natasha Balaf, our legislative liaison and policy coordinator, is going to provide that update to you. Yeah, good morning. Um, I don't know if I need to restate it for the record. I'm Natasha Balif. I'm the legislative and policy coordinator for the division. Um, I just have a handful of bills that I was gonna run through. I don't have a presentation this morning. Um, so the first one on my list is House Bill 21. This is an Open and Public Meetings Act bill. Um, this wouldn't actually change any way that you guys are handling um, open meetings, um, but this would require any public body ho holding an open meeting to allow reasonable opportunity for the public to give verbal comments. Um, this is actually being heard for the first time today at 4 p.m. in the House Government Operations Committee, so I'll listen in on that. I did see that there was a substitute submitted this morning, um, so we'll see what happens, and I'll, I'll provide update um, in my weekly email. And then um, House Bill 92 is the state mushroom designation. Um, this one designates the porcini as the state mushroom. This has passed the House and it's now currently in the Senate. Um, same thing with House Bill 137, it's the state crustacean. This designates the brine shrimp as the state crustacean. Um, there's a lot of pushback on it. Um, a lot of people don't think that it should be a state crustacean, but it did pass House and it's now in the Senate. Um, House Bill 144 is high cost infrastructure development tax credit. Um, this will give operators a tax credit, credit if they build a high cost underground mine in a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth class county. Um, this failed its first committee hearing and it's being heard again today at 4 p.m. in the House Revenue Taxation Committee. Um, this actually won't affect the division, but we're still monitoring it, just making sure we don't get roped in. Um, House Bill 173 is government attorney fee amendments, and this um, will allow a private party to recover attorney and expert fees if they win in a civil action. Um, basically, all of the agencies within the state are upset over this. Um, I know that the governor's office has been very aware of this and that they're going to um, speak against it. It was supposed to be heard yesterday, and they held it until today. 
Um, it will also be heard at 4 p.m. in the House political subdivisions. Um, we're slightly concerned about it because it could result in frivolous lawsuits um, just so that they can recover attorney fees. Um, we'll see where it goes. I, I keep hearing that it's going to die, that it'll be vetoed. It's still on its first, um, not substitution, <laughs> it's on its first draft of the bill or first proposed bill. So we'll see where it goes. Everyone is upset over it. Um, House Bill 258 is motor vehicle light amendments. Um, this one has actually passed the House and Senate and is being enrolled. Um, it will require a vehicle operator to have their lights on during sunrise, sunset, and anytime you can't see more than a thousand feet ahead of you. And within that bill, they have mentioned if you have automatic lights, you still have to adhere to this and, and be mindful. Um, House Bill 412 is state employment revisions. This is an extension of last year's AX bill where it changed um, supervisors over to an at-will working position. Um, this bill will create an AY schedule and it would apply to all state um, employees. It was heard yesterday and they presented a lot of stats saying that um, employees really like it and that they just love it and then at the end of their presentation it came out that those were all federal employees and every single comment that they heard um, was in opposition. So they are going to, they held it yesterday, they're going to hear it again today um, at 4 p.m. and that will be in the House Government Operations Committee to anyone who's interested. Um, this one I know that you guys have heard about is House Bill 527. This is mining operation amendments. Um, the part, the part that we put in would change our mining statute to clarify large and small mines. It would introduce a permit order. It would clarify notice of intentions for small mines. It changes the public comment period for large mines um, to have that at the beginning of the process so that that can streamline approvals. Um, it also spells out the procedure for participating in permit orders. And then the part that we're not too happy about is um, they touch on vested mining use statute, and so it would change the definition of vested mining use to include ownership of partly contiguous properties. It also addresses people wishing to challenge vested mining use and gives them a time frame in when they can um, make those challenges. And then finally, I know you're all well aware of this, it um, has the board. Board of Oil, Gas, and Mining hearing those challenges. Um, so yesterday we submitted a fiscal note of about 330,000 for a couple attorney positions and um, some administrative support. Um, moving on to Senate bills, we have Senate Bill 62. This is hydrogen amendments and it establishes a hydrogen advisory council within the, Ener the Office of Energy Development. Um, this bill has already passed the House and Senate and it's being sent for enrollment. And then Senate Bill 107, this is oil and gas severance tax amendments. It creates a fund from the additional revenue brought in from the oil and gas severance tax and it will be controlled by the Community Impact Fund Board. Um, this shouldn't affect our um, severance tax distribution and it's already um, past the Senate side. It is facing a little bit of pushback on the House side and um, this is another bill that will be heard at 4 p.m. Um, in the House Revenue and Taxation Committee. And then finally, SB 268 came out this week. It's a lithium severance tax, and it clarifies that chloride compounds and salt that contain lithium as metalliferous minerals, and they will pay into the mining severance tax. This is something that will be beneficial to the division, but we're not sure by how much. Um, and those are all the bills that I had on my list to present on. I'm not sure if you guys have any questions or if you want me to look at a specific bill. I'm more than happy to do that now or offline. Uh, thank you. Um, any questions from the board? And those that are, are calling in, if you could just wave your, your hand at us. Uh, if you do have a question, we'll, we'll call on you. Huh? Yes, Mr. Hansen. Natasha, I just wanted to ask you about HB 527. I see that it's gone through its first reading. Have you heard anything more on its progress? No, I haven't. Um, I didn't see that it went through its first reading. Um, last I saw it had just um, had been sent out for a fiscal note, so I haven't haven't heard anything on it yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other board member questions? I just have one uh, question, maybe clarification uh, again on on HB five twenty seven. 
That includes sand and gravel deposits, is that correct? <laughs> I believe so, that's what I've heard. It's, it's kind of unclear. I think it includes sand and gravel deposits to an extent on the vested mining use, but beyond that, I think they are still somewhat exempt from division authority. We're getting some insider information here, perhaps. <laughs> Dana Dean, Deputy Director over Mining. Um, as I understand it, it only includes uh, mines that have a permit with the division. So if it's like the point of the mountain where they're in bedrock and mining and they have a permit, then it applies to them. If it's an exempt operation, this does not apply. They have to have a mining permit. So okay, that's that's very helpful. Traditional sand and gravel it, under our rules, which is not, <laughs> again, it's a size thing. It's not a, a geologist wouldn't call it sand and gravel, but um, if it's exempted by our rules, it's not covered by this HB five two seven. Okay, that's helpful. I was I was curious if we might be hearing vested mining. Uh, interests uh, cases, uh, and yet we don't have jurisdiction over her, right. the operation any later, her, you know, for I operation closure, bonding, et cetera. Huh? Maybe, maybe at some point in time they'll uh, unexempt sand and gravel, but for now, um, that vested mining use only applies to someone who has a mine permit. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Director Baza. Okay. Thank you, Natasha. Appreciate that. Um, I don't have anything under other items. I would like to talk briefly about uh, next month's agenda. Um, if you look at what has been submitted, we had two requests for hearing examiner. Um, originally, there were probably four items on the March agenda. So with these two requests for hearing examiner, which uh, will be conducted by division personnel. Um, March agenda is looking very light. You'll basically hear the two reports from the uh, hearing examiner. And as far as I know, that's it. We won't have any other items on the agenda. But um, I did want to say as part of that, that it's hard for us to predict how many items will show up on any particular month's agenda. Um, in this particular case, we were happy to accommodate the requests for a hearing examiner. It, it does create a burden on division staff, division attorneys, and uh, we can sort through that as long as we're dealing with, you know, one or two requests that come in. Um, if it's more than that, we may have to wrangle things a little bit in order to, to address those hearing examiner requests. But... I, I did want to point out to you that because of the way the board agenda for March is shaping up, with only those two requests for hearing examiners, it is going to end up being a light board meeting in March. So just wanted to bring that up to your attention. Thank you. I, I, uh, I appreciate that. And I think we will, uh, you know, we will make this an iterative process and we will work with you on uh, on the use of hearing examiners to make sure it's, it doesn't pose an undue burden. Unfortunately, it would be most useful in days where we have a heavy docket load and um, then you have a heavy, heavy load as well. So uh, yes. we will keep talking to each other. Indeed, thank you. Um, that is all I had, oh, sorry. I just had a question, I, I think a question for the uh, chairman and Director Baza. If you're saying there's no, uh, agenda items for March? Is that is that what I'm hearing? That is what, other than hearing the report of the hearing examiner on those two items, I don't, there may be one, excuse me. Looks like we have the two reports of hearing examiner and then we have one, okay. one matter that's on the agenda. Thanks, you answered my question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Begley, did you have a question or comment? Mike Begley, Council for the Board. Uh, Director Baza, we will, as you will see today, we will be continuing the last docketed item here to next month. So the Board will have the show cause hearing for next month with respect to the annual reporting. All right. Thank you. 
that is all I had to report on, and uh, I'll give you some time back and also the opportunity for public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so now uh, I would like to, to open the floor for the opportunity for public comment. Is there anybody that would like to comment? And in that case, please come forward. <laughs> Seeing and hearing none, uh, we will adjourn for just over 15 minutes and, and reconvene at 10 a.m. Huh? Thank you. <laughs>